1976, Dr. Herbert Hopkins, a UFO researcher in Maine, is home alone having let his wife and children go to a local cinema to watch a film. He receives a phone call from an unknown man who claimed to belong to a local UFO investigation group. He tells Hopkins he was interested in discussing a recent case in the hopes of coming round to the house later that evening and having a talk. What happened next is a story that has haunted Herbert from that day on. Welcome to Paranormality, and this is the main Men in Black. So welcome everybody to episode two of Paranormality. This is where I normally would introduce James, who unfortunately couldn't make it to this episode uh, because he has been visited by the Men in Black also. Uh, so today we are joined by Sean. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, as I say, you can call us James if you like. I, I won't answer, but <laughs> whatever makes it easier. The thing is, I'm I'm very reliant on my script, so there may be times where I am calling you James and I don't even realise. So if that does happen, just remind me that you're Sean, you're not James, and I'll I'll continue on. Last week we discussed the Nimitz Tic Tac, which for me is like it's the pinnacle of ufos it, mm. it's got everything it's got audio transcript it's got radar data it's got videos it, it's it's literally got everything and had you heard of the nimitz encounter prior to that episode at all sean uh no i hadn't actually so um it was a bit of an eye-opener um i was very impressed um it, it, yeah i say just just a massive eye-opener as you say that the sheer amount of evidence um and is the, the paid observers I think that's what you called them the um, trained observers, yeah. Trained observer, there you go. Yeah, the, the, the fact that these people are, are, are fully trained, they they know uh, what to look out for, they, they don't mistake blips on the radar for something that they aren't, and the fact there was a chase as well, it was just phenomenal. It's the sexiest case to start with. So we, if you haven't listened to that episode, we are on all podcast platforms. We're on Spotify, where you can give us a five star, same as uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. We're on Google Podcasts. We're on the entire lot. But this week, we are going to be taking... A, a trip into Wooville. This one is a lot more bizarre, and I'm going to say it straight away off the bat, I personally don't believe much of this story, but I will we'll discuss that later at the end of the show. In the meantime, if you do enjoy listening to Paranormality, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. This is a real passion project, having come off the back of something very different, and I absolutely adore UFOs and UAPs. We are going to be taking diversions into things like cryptids and ghosts and uh, CE5 experiences and we're hoping to get a few guests on but if you enjoy the show I'd be really grateful if you could share it with someone else who you think might enjoy this too and you can follow us on Twitter which is Pod Normality, our Facebook page which is just Paranormality Podcast, send people our way, ask us questions, we're really receptive to any experiences that people may have had or if you want to come on the show at any point and sort of share your experiences, we're more than happy to do that also. So um, let's let's dive in to the main Men in Black. So, Sean, when I say Men in Black, what do you think of? Uh, Will Smith prior to slapping people around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's basically what everyone sort of goes straight to is, is Will Smith. Um, for me, I don't think of the Men in Black as literal Men in Black. I see it as more of a code word to like, secret government agencies. And they do exist. It can get, I'm not going to go down really too much of a conspiracy rabbit hole with this, but these agencies that we don't know of do exist. A tip is one I spoke of last week, um, if you were listening to that one, Sean, yep. where Lou Elizondo heads that one up. Uh, there are black book projects with private contractors. So people like, um, oh, what are they called? The Skunk Works is one of the um, one of the Black Book projects, and I who is Skunk Works run by? I'll have to give that a quick Google. Um, Skunk Works do basically all of the um, like high tech uh, Lockheed Martin. That's who it is. It's the Lockheed Martin Advanced Development Program. Skunk Works, and you've got J. Ale uh, Dr. J. Alec H uh, Alan Hynek, who was Project Blue Book. And if you don't know Project Blue Book, that was basically the government sending Dr. Hynek to UFO experiences houses so that he could debunk them and say it was swamp gas and the mm. lights coming off of Venus and all of that lot. And we spoke last week about ATIP, the Advanced Aerial uh, Threat Identification Program that was run by Lou Elizondo. So these programs do exist. Whether or not they beam lights into your eyes and make you forget things, that's, that's another story. So 
what's your thoughts then on these like sort of secret government agencies? Do you think they exist, Sean? And to what sort of scope do you think they are around? Um, I, you, you sort of already said it, Harry, to be honest. Um, they, they clearly do. Um, as to, I mean, going around as they are with these, these laser guns and, and, and all this sort of thing, probably not. Um, but we do know <laughs> yeah. the, the, there's the Secret Service and spies and things anyway, which are sort of sub, subterfuge the part of the government. Um, there's clearly other things. There's, there's web manufacturers and sort of aviation and, and that whole research division. And, and as they go around that, there's, there's definitely things that, governments aren't going to talk about top secrets obviously we're in a it always a state of constant pre-war so you know you're always worth having that that bigger stick than than your enemies so there's always a, a form of secrecy and uh, they clearly are um agencies are, are part of the agencies that obviously are out here doing this this exact thing uh, you mentioned like the, the the whole blue book thing um and the, the amount of declassified documents uh, which like the air force were tracking sort of ufo phenomena um it, it proves the fact that the, these do exist um it's to, it's to as i say as to what they're actively doing going around and flying cars and, and, and whatnot definitely definitely not down that route but i mean there's definitely monitoring out there so the flying cars thing is is quite interesting because that is obviously sort of hollywood hollywoodification of something that does exist in the realms of reality but i wanted to pick this story specifically because it it's one of the cases that when i was sort of growing up investigating and i say investigating going on google and searching for things this is always a case that showed up on the sort of like the eight most freaky paranormal experiences and that i'm torn with this because Herbert Hopkins was a very respected person in his community and everyone who speaks to him will attest to the fact that he was a very honest person and he really didn't have any reason to make this up. The problem is, and I'm going to jump into now the call, which is the first part of this case, it's very, very bizarre. And so, you know, if, if there is someone listening to this and they do believe this case in its entirety... I'm happy for you to believe that. What I'm not going to be doing here is debunking anything. All I want to do is tell the story as it is and have a discussion about it. So a little bit of background as to who Herbert Herbert actually is will shed some light on this case. So he was helping out, as I said in the, the intro, on a UFO case. And it was actually called the Stevens UFO case, which was a local sighting that somebody had had. He was happily married, had a few children, had a good job. He was well respe- well respected law-abiding citizen. He was very much an everyday man. There was nothing suspicious about this person. You know, everything was by the book with him. So although what what we're about to discuss may seem a little bit nonsensical, this is a statement that's coming from an academic who was at least respected enough in the field to be lending his help to other UFO cases. Um, So on the day of the event, he was home alone. His family had all gone out for the day um, to the local theatre and it was pretty much a, a fairly unremarkable day with him just doing some sort of investigation work on the Stevens case. And then the phone rings and a man who claimed to be from a New Jersey UFO group was looking to assist him with the Stevens case. So he called him up completely out of the blue. I hear that you're working on the Stevens case. Would you allow me to come to your house later that evening to discuss it? Now, quite out of character for Herbert, he completely agreed and said to the person, I'm happy for you to come to my house this evening. We'll sit down. We'll go through what I know. Hopkins then says that he hung the phone up. He walked to the front door from his living room to open the primary door so that just the screen door was going to be open so that he could sit there and he would be able to see when the visitor would arrive. When he opened the front door, to Hopkins' surprise, he says that he saw a man clad in dark na- a dark navy suit, dark grey gloves and a bowler type hat walking down his driveway. One thing to remember about this is this is 1976. There were no mobile phones, there were no smartphones, and Hopkins was aware that there were no phone booths anywhere near his house, and he became quite confused about the fact that this man had seemingly appeared almost instantaneously out of nowhere. Hopkins would later recall, I saw no car, and even if he did have a car, he could not have possibly got to my house as quickly as I had left the phone and gone to the front door. Hopkins greeted the stranger and went to sit down to discuss the Stevens case. So already, Sean, a little bit weird. Very. Right. I mean, just because you've owned someone and then some random person turns up at your house. I mean, are you, are you, are you assuming it's them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing that it sort of triggers my sort of 
the hairs on the back of my neck straight away that something isn't quite right because this is the mid 70s where the only way of calling people like he rightly says is a phone booth or a landline phone so it took him 30 seconds to walk from his living room to his front door and this guy just appeared this is what hopkins says Mm. so if you were in that put yourself in that situation you talk even if it was today and you get a message from a friend to say oh did you want to do something today yeah yeah I'll, i'll come over in a little bit and as soon as you put the phone down he's at your door even that's a bit weird right yeah, 100%. I mean, the thing that sticks out for me here, though, is that he's been asked to support. I mean, out of character, he said yes. Uh, but has he even actually met this person before? Does he have any understanding of what they even look like or who they are? Has no idea who this person is, no. He's never spoken to this person before. Um, he lives in Maine. This person is claiming to be from New Jersey, which is a good few hours away. If you know the sort of north... Um, is it the northeast? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah, the northeast of... Um, northeast coast of america they are quite close but it is still a few hours drive from new jersey to maine Mm. so yeah he he doesn't know who this person is he's allowing him in his house and then out of nowhere he appears um so hopkins was the one who did most of the talking when the visitor arrived i sort of i don't envy him because i feel like that's what i'm like on these podcasts um hopkins was the one who he did most of the talking and uh the visitor didn't present hopkins with a name he literally just said, I'm here to talk about the case, and sat listening, not really answering back. And the visitor rarely said anything other than remarks along the lines of, yes, that's how I understand it, or yes, that is what I have heard. Um, and when responding to Herbert, the way that he spoke, Hopkins said that it felt like he knew about the case prior to arriving. So so th- this guy was sort of giving off an awe, aura of... I know about the information you're telling me. And it was almost as if Hopkins was having to reassure him that what he thought was correct. At this point in the conversation, the stranger wiped his mouth with the back of his glove and Hopkins noticed a red mark was left on the glove. He noticed that it was a lipstick mark and this drew attention to the mouth of the stranger. What he saw was the man seemingly had no lips, but rather a small slit where his mouth was and that the lipstick had been applied to give his mouth a more human appearance. Personally, I feel mm. like if someone walked in my door and they had no lips, I would notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a pretty standout thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's one of the first things you look at when someone's talking to you. You look at their lips, and I feel like if I was looking at someone who had no lips but had red lipstick smeared across a slit in their face, I feel like I might notice that but again we can only go off of what hopkins has said um so hopkins noted that his eyes were quite unremarkable although they were dark colored and they did appear to possess pupils like any other man this is when things started to turn and hopkins started to get worried the visitor noted that hopkins had his hands in his pockets and told him you have two coins in your pockets this was apparently true because it was the change that Um, Herbert had from paying the paper boy earlier that day. He asked Herbert to remove a coin from his pocket and hold it in his hands. Now, warning, I completely don't believe what I'm about to say. Um, But, (laughs) you know, I'm just telling the case as it is. Herbert states that he watched as the coin started to take an odd, fuzzy appearance, floating in front of him, and within a matter of seconds, the coin had vanished. The stranger stated... Neither you nor anyone else on this plane will ever see that coin again. This is reportedly what he said directly after the floating coin went fuzzy and vanished. I can't believe I said those words. Um, Hopkins told the stranger that that was a neat trick. Why would... Again, this is just stuff that doesn't... It doesn't sit with me that this is how a conversation went. So Hopkins told the stranger that that was a neat trick, who then asked, again, a very bizarre question. He asked if he knew of Betty and Barney Hill. Now, Sean, do you know about Betty and Barney Hill? Uh, No, I was going to say Betty and Barney Rubble, to be honest. No, so um, (laughs) Betty and Barney Hill, um, they're a very famous alien abduction case um, where Barney and his wife Betty um, were claimed to have been abducted on a, a dark night as they were driving on an abandoned road. And there's, personally, I think there's a lot of credence to their story definitely going to be talking about it in the future but there's a lot of research that i need to put into it because it's so well documented 
that I don't want to leave anything out. But it's probably going to be a two or three part episode, that one. But Betty and Barney Hill claim to have been taken aboard a UFO in 1961 and showed star systems that they then drew out at a later date uh, during some hypnotherapy sessions. Hopkins told the stranger um, that he was aware of the case. And the stranger said, are you aware of how they died? Hopkins told the stranger that he believed Barney Hill had died from a heart attack. But the stranger replied, Barney Hill had died because he did not have a heart, just as you no longer have that coin. So we're going to just take a quick break here so far. Yeah. Can you can you see why I'm not really in the realms of belief with this one? It's, I, I completely understand. Um, I mean, first and foremost, someone that you don't recognise comes to the door and you say, oh, you must be Bob. Come in. And yeah. Then well, he didn't even give his name. And didn't just, even give his name. And they're just nodding. Yeah, yeah. That, that sounds right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And then suddenly wipes the lips off. And why he, he responds to a coin disappearing? Oh, that's neat. Not yeah, where's the lips gone? <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. That's my that's my main issue. Like I'm, I am quite torn with this. I do believe that something happened. We we will obviously talk about that nearer towards the end of the episode. But I am genuinely of the belief that something has happened with this case. Um, there are a few hypotheses that have been drawn from this that we will discuss near the end but do i believe that someone came to his house yes i do i do believe that someone came to his house do i believe that he was working on ufo cases and he may have been contacted by a government agency yes i that may well have happened the issue for me is there's so many inconsistencies with this story between him saying that he's an academic family man who doesn't leave the house a lot and he's now inviting a stranger from another state into his house late at night when there's no witnesses who then seemingly performed magic in front of him and then starts asking very bizarre questions about other UFO and abduction cases. Like there's just stuff that doesn't quite line up for me, but again, there's enough information there to keep me interested. It's a really bizarre one. Mm. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just a, it's a very strange one for me. Now, the conversation from that point then moved back to the Stevens UFO case that Hopkins said he'd been working on. Hopkins recalled that the stranger told me, or rather I should say he stated that I had a tape recording on the Stevens case on hypnosis and details of the craft and so forth. He didn't ask me, he didn't tell me, he just said it. He told the stranger that he was in possession of tapes and recordings from a hypnosis session and that, and the stranger told him that he should destroy all documentations and tapes relating to this case. Hopkins said that it was as if he was giving me these instructions. He was not in the least bit indignant, not in the least bit angry. He just said to do it. And this is where Hopkins became seriously concerned about his safety, um, according to his statement, which was compounded by the next statement that the stranger said. The stranger appeared to indicate now that Hopkins would suffer the same fate as Barney Hill if he chose to continue his involvement in the Stevens UFO investigation. He didn't say that he would return to his house, rather he would know when the tapes had been destroyed, and he would act accordingly. Over the course of these conversations, and due to the stranger's appearance, he noted that the orders had been given to him in a a rather inhumane and machine way. And again, this is where it just, it takes one of those turns that I, I just have trouble with. Over the following minutes, Hopkins noted that the the demeanour of the man became even more strange, and as the conversation concluded, he noted that his speech became slower, and the spaces in between the individual words became longer and longer. As he went to leave, he stood up slowly and announced to the room, my energy is running low, must go now, goodbye. Again, do you believe that that would happen, Sean? I mean, it's what I normally say when I'm about to wax at the room. <laughs> um, it's yeah. Again, we have to remember this is 1976. You know, they didn't have advanced robotics. I think that's where he's trying to get to: is that he believes that this man to be a robot. Um, it just—it all sounds very like 1950s body snatcher films. Like, it, yeah, lo-fi sci-fi. It, <laughs> yeah, it, it all seems very Doctor Who. Yeah. And yeah. I think that is my main issue with it. And again, Hopkins stated that he watched as a stranger grasped onto the railing 
moving one foot in front of each other in a very deliberate and pronounced way. Instead of walking the way he had done when he arrived, the stranger walked around the corner in the complete opposite direction. Hopkins noted that he simply vanished around the corner. He then saw a bright blue light. <laughs> uh, he saw a bright blue light while the stranger was stood at the corner, but that no shadow was cast. And as the man walked towards the light, Hopkins simply assumed it to be car headlights. Hopkins stepped onto the porch, but saw no evidence of any vehicle, no tracks, no marks, and no sound. So that's that's not the whole case, but that's where I'm just going to leave it for the time being. So do you? Be- is there any part of you that believes anything that has happened so far? Because there's parts of this that I do believe happened. I do believe someone came and saw him. I do believe that he was in his house alone, and I do believe they talked about the Stevens case. But I'd love to hear your thoughts so far, Sean. Um, so I definitely believe his, his family were out trying to be away from him. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it sounds very much like you say someone has come to see him. He's been spooked by it. And retrospectively, he's then made it more and more elaborate. And I imagine he's told this story a few times. And each time it's got more and more elaborate. Yeah. And yeah, definitely. Having someone who potentially, I mean, wipes the face and they've got a lipstick mark on there. I mean, it could have just been, you know, fashion at the time. You never know. But then <laughs> yeah. but somebody then saying he's wiped his lipstick off and his lips disappeared. It sounds like it's just, you know, snowballing a little bit. But as you say, yeah, someone probably has arrived. They've they've gleaned some information off him and told him to destroy some of the recordings that he's got and, and, and left. He probably felt a bit foolish that he's let a random stranger in the house and he's then not say concocted a story, but you know Made it a bit more elaborate. I think his imagination so may have his imagination may have got the better of him. Uh, we are we're quite close to the end of the actual case itself. It's why I picked this one because it it's quite a short case, but then it gives us time afterwards to discuss sort of our thoughts on a lot of it, as well as like we had that short discussion at the start about you know the potential outreach of these secret organizations so uh, the, the hopkins family are then said to have returned to see herbert visibly visibly upset after the encounter and after a few minutes he joined his son on the driveway to look for any evidence of a vehicle that may have been there they found nothing to indicate that a car had been there however the son did spot some large marks that looked close to resembling t- uh, tread markings from a large vehicle such as a tractor which this family didn't own a tractor. Part of me is thinking, why would a UFO have tractor tires? But again, it's just, it's another sort of inconsistency or another sort of layer to this story that I just have a bit of trouble with. One final note that Hopkins had was that the entire experience was actually witnessed by his two family pets. So the family dog was absolutely petrified of the man when he arrived. He started barking when he saw him through the door. And as he entered the house... He whimpered, he cried, and he ran up to the main bedroom and actually hid, apparently, in um, one of the the closets in the main bedroom. The cat didn't care at all, just if you wanted to know. Cat Mm. was not bothered whatsoever by this bloke, but he made... (laughs) Exactly. He made specific note to say that the family dog was terrified of this man. So, interesting you say that, because he was saying he obviously hung up the phone went to the front door, opened the sort of the inside door, left the, the partition there and saw someone. A complete stranger walking towards you. At that point, you never mentioned the dog was whimpering and, and, and clearly distressed by a stranger walking towards the door. At that point, why? Why would you let that person in your house? Yeah. For me, there's a lot of things here where if it happened to me and this random person, I mean, if I was sitting down with my hands in my pockets, which is very difficult to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but if, if you go through all that and someone wipes the lips off and, and tells us to do things and then starts splurting out that the battery's running low and then stumbles out of your out of your house and you see lights which you think are um, from a car but cast no shadow, which it's a really weird thing to remember, but thinking it was a car light, um, why wouldn't you go and check? If this, if this yeah. thing is slowly struggling to walk out of your house, even just being a good host, <laughs> you're not going there. Yeah, you would just say, oh, come on, I'll give you a hand. I'll give you a Yeah, you would just offer or, that help. Or just sort of watch them disappear ominously around the corner. You'd, you'd go and see what the hell was going on. And yeah, yeah it, there's, there's like I say, there's, there's bits in here which don't really make sense. And I think he's probably been intimidated. Something's yeah, been because... said. And he's 
elaborate. He's just he's made the story up to either comfort himself because something traumatic's happened because that obviously people go through that and they do yeah. make a, a version of reality that sort of suits them and how that is a, is a mental sort of coping mechanism. And the fact that he could have went away, he's heard a car or something and they drove away or something's happened and he's just sat there scared. And he's been questioning, oh, why didn't you do this? Oh, well, he was, he just disappeared. I couldn't go check where he was. But exactly. It, it's it's very much like that to me. But as you say, I mean, they, they, they do have these agencies and people out there. Um, something obviously has spooked them to an extent. Um, however, I will say one thing, and that is a lot of terrible people in this world, when they're described by those that know them, family and friends, it's always... They were very quiet. They were very normal. They kept themselves to themselves. And then they do something yeah. drastic. So that has no bearing at all for me. Um, but clearly, if, if he's had a family and he's been distressed to come back, something's happened. And I think that's the that's the part I believe. Um, yeah, I so I, yeah. I do believe that something has happened to spook him. Um, frustratingly, shortly after the visit, Hopkins is said to have destroyed all of the evidence of the Stevens UFO case. Um but he admits that he regrets doing so. And we are we are very close to the end of this specific case. And I'm glad that you brought up the um, the coping mechanism because that's definitely something that I, I do want to talk about in a second. Um, and many, many people have discussed various sort of explanations for this over the years. So some think that this was extraterrestrial in nature. Uh, so they do believe that a robotic or synthetic life form came to visit him at his house in order to destroy evidence of the Stevens case. That's a bit of a reach for me, but that is what some people do truly believe. And, you know, I've only researched this for about a week and a half in depth. I've known about this case for quite some time. I've never come across, like, the smoking gun. I've never come across that bit of evidence that's, like... This is the bit that unlocks the whole story. For me, like with the Tic Tac, the radar data, if we ever got that radar data, that would be the smoking gun to show exactly like, bang, there you are. There's the definitive the definitive proof. We know that that radar data is there. We just won't get hold of it because it's top secret. For me, with, with the Hopkins case, that there's never a single bit that I could say, if we figured out this, it would open up everything. Some people simply think that this was a prank, that some local kids got bored they knew of this weird guy that liked to talk about aliens they put a rubber mask on and they thought they would freak him out that for me sounds quite plausible yeah, yeah. i feel like that's something that teenagers could possibly do some think that it was connected to government agencies looking to silence ufo research so project blue book for instance that was known to try and silence cases and um j alec Hynek. J. Allen Hynek has come out in the past, well, had come out in the past, to discuss the fact that they did sometimes use subterfuge in order to push cases away or to sort of not mislead people, but just turn people's attention. So there are some people that think that this was genuinely connected to an agency of some description looking to stop his research from happening. Some people just don't think this happened at all. They think that he destroyed the evidence, maybe accidentally, and that he then had to come up with a story that the people in his UFO group would find interesting enough to not worry about the fact that the case files are all gone. If you're looking to sort of calm down some angry ufologists, the best way to do that is come back at them with an amazing UFO story. So some people do think that might be what happens. Um, as for Hopkins himself, he does have some ideas on who the visitors may have been. So this is his own words. So... Scientists have theorised for years on alternative dimensions. As to what this man was, or where I think he may have come from, his statement of a different plane, with the coin, I must go along with many others as they think that he was simply from another dimension, and the man I think undoubtedly came from another place. So that's what Hopkins thinks. He thinks that this was an interdimensional being that has travelled through a portal of some description, and that's where that coin has gone. But I'm glad you brought up the sort of PTSD-esque nature of this story because my personal opinion is, is that he was sort of like, he was visited by an agency of some description, a three-letter agency, 
And I think he was probably roughed up a bit and very scared and threats may have happened to his safety or his family's safety. And I think he's closed himself off from that reality and may and his brain has made connections that he hasn't made in order to make this sort of fit the narrative of him investigating UFOs and then these people showing up. Um, but I'd be really interested, because I've talked now for half an hour, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on the entire case, Sean. Um, I'm probably quite similar, Harry, to be honest. Um, it would be interesting to know, was it the Stevens case, did you say, that there were? Yeah. It would be interesting, I mean, to say if there's no information, but as to what, what was involved in that. That could, if, if, as you say, if there was a government agency or something involved, it's quite easy for them to have done something like this, where yeah. wiretapping got its name because they'd actively tap into your phone line. So if you're having a conversation, say, oh, yeah, I want to discuss this, and that rings alarm bells because it's some sort of covert operation that they're trying to cover up. And you have that conversation, they literally march to your house. And as you say, try and try and spook you, rough them up a little bit, and yeah. make them forcibly destroy what recordings he had. Um yeah, for me, there's there's potential for that, and it's a very good point that you say if he's helping out studies for UFOs and he's going to really knock them, the fact he's destroyed them accidentally or forced to do so, um, the best way to get around that is to come up with a fantastical story. Um, yeah. There's just a lot in his account that makes no sense. I think the, the things to take away with, clearly there was some evidence to do with this initial case, which is vanished. So that there are, when I say everything's gone, there is still a knowledge of this case. So it, David Stevens was the chap's name, and he was apparently abducted from his car by some sort of like quite strange beings, is what he said. Um, there is a small amount of information, and I know that there's a few podcasts out there as well that have covered the, the, the David Stevens case, but Herbert Hopkins said that he had a lot more data that would really open up the case and that's what was destroyed um but apparently yeah he was um abducted by his car by some weird alien like creatures and i think that's where this this line has come from of he was visited by something else because i think that through this trauma i think that his story and the stevens case in his mind, have been put together. And um, a lot of people don't realise that one of the side effects of depression is that you just miss time. Like, you can just go an entire day and not even realise that it's vanished. And I think if you if you add in aspects of PTSD, possibly maybe depressive personality, you know, he's, he's on, his, on his own in his home and his family are doing things without him. I think there's like... There's little breadcrumbs that maybe line up to paint the picture of maybe someone who was very isolated in his work, who was obsessed with UFOs, you know, like like I am. And then some sort of trauma has happened and, and he's just tried to cope with it. That's personally what I think has happened. Would I really love an interdimensional being to be the actual answer for this? Obviously I would, because that would be amazing. But there's just... There's too many straws to grasp onto, I think, for me. There's keeping an open mind and there's keeping an open mind. Um, I think this is a, a, a stretch too far. Um, yeah. There's a couple of things that just don't don't stand up for me. He was helping out other investigators on this case. So he didn't pull the data together. The other investigators did. And he was looking at it. He must have. That must have been the way it was happened. And... This is a case that no one was able to get to the bottom of. So either he's had something and he's lost it, or for me, it almost sounds like he's fabricated the fact that he's had all this all this information that was going to break this case open and then trying to make a name for himself, solving the unsolvable case, yeah, and then excusing it away by by just you know a, a visitor. There's just there's so much that makes sort of no sense. I mean, the, the bit of, bits of evidence that you'd sort of you'd hope for. He received a call from the different groups. Yeah. Said, Could you help us out on this? It would be very easy because in those days, I'm pretty sure there was either there was exchanges still to trace calls. It would be quite easy. Yeah, there would have been. Yeah, it was before. Call. It was before, obviously, satellite calls. So yeah, it would have been sort of if you're crossing state lines and calling, then yeah, there would have been like physical, actual people doing like it's why they're called phone lines because there's literally people that had 
lines of phone call that they would plug in and plug out. So yeah, there would there would be ways of tracing it. So um, even checking the number of the person who's called you, I mean, th- there would have been able to do that because in them days, I mean, even even now your house phone may not ring ring too often, but in them days it was very rare. So it would have been quite easy to get the number that's called you to check that. And if that was the case, did that person ever show up? Because they did say, well, I'm going to come and see you. Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing they ne- they never showed up. So where where was that call? Did that call actually... To be fair, it's a good it? point. It's a very good point that you make. It's not one I even thought of, is that that phone call could just be completely separate to this event that happened. I- I've I, In my mind, I've always thought that maybe he even fabricated that phone call. But actually, it may well have actually been a legitimate phone call and then this event that happened was just at a completely different time. Um, and because of maybe the trauma he suffered through the visit, that I, personally, I believe he's been visited by a government agency. That That's my, my thoughts. Um, now, there are a few things, and I want to go back to something you said a moment ago, where you said that the light cast no shadow. Now, that's a very... I'm glad you picked up on that, because I personally... That's one of the things for me that I picked up as to that giving it some credence to the fact that a craft could have been there because there have been lots of insinuations that these craft, and I talked about it last week, work by manipulating gravity. So um, Bob Lazar is someone that we definitely will talk about in a future episode. Bob Lazar says that these craft create gravity wells that sort of bend space and time around them. And so if an object was to be sp- bending the fabric of space and time around it, light wouldn't be able to escape that area. So if these craft were casting light, it may be that they don't cause a shadow because the light is located purely outside of the bounds of our space. And I know that's, again, that's very wooey and very out there, but that for me, I can't explain away the shadow not appearing as like that not giving it credence to something being there because there have been cases that I know um, Jeremy Corbell spoke about on a recent Joe Rogan episode where a huge light appeared above someone at a military facility, but it cast no shadows over anything. So I'm glad you picked that up. Mm -hmm. Um, The purpose of this episode really isn't about UAP phenomena. It's more about those secret societies. So I am of the belief, like I said, that, that some government agency has visited this person but who's visited him i don't know because there must be agencies we don't know about right oh 100 100 um it's definitely possible definitely possible um there's lots as you, uh, you already sort of said in, in this uh in this story which is very hard to swallow um for me i i mean i'm, I'm sort of skeptical skeptical anyway um it, it's just a step too far Someone who's an expert, I just say, it's, it, seeing the light that casts no shadows adds sort of credence to the fact that something could have been there. However, someone who's an expert in all these things that's actively looking into and, and breaking cases that no one else can break. If you're telling this story to other ufologists, you know exactly the little crumbs to, to leave in that story. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's a very good point. For me, it's, it's that. It's either there hasn't been any evidence and he's made up a story to explain the way that oh, the, the evidence is gone now. And so I, I've cracked this case. I can't tell you about because the evidence is now gone. Well, and, according and- to the people, <laughs> according to the people that have that, that were working with him, there were tapes, there were recordings of a hypnotherapy session that were passed over to him, uh, and that's that's the stuff that was destroyed. So th- there is, for me, it it does give credence to the fact that he he had a lot of potentially sort of I don't want to say incriminating but the way that so James brought it up last week in the episode is that a lot of this stuff that is top secret when you're in those facilities you have to be signing non-disclosure agreements you have to be signing NDAs so that this information doesn't just leak and so it could even be something as mundane that top secret information was taken or that NDA classified information was taken and he simply gave it back to the government agencies. But then how does someone who's actively sort of in that UFO community explain to someone that, oh, well, I gave all the information back to the feds? But that's That would erode all of his sort of good standing with that entire community, wouldn't it? Yeah, true. 
as I say, it, it, it's there's a story there that's been fabricated, whether it's a court mechanism, whether it's to hide something that was lost, destroyed, or I think never existed. Um, I think that's it. So it could well have been someone's visited him and, and something's happened there. Um, yeah, th- there's too many holes in it for me. Like, see, it, as well, in, there's, there's it, one it hole. Um, there's one see, hole it, covered in lipstick that <laughs> instantly took me away <laughs> from but it. If, if there was recordings and these recordings were so important and cracked this case wide open and he's the only one who could crack this case because of these recordings. You wouldn't that, destroy it, would you? If he did destroy them, I mean, is the guy who was abducted still alive? Could they not just go through hypnotherapy sessions again? Yeah, would, that's a very good point. Were they not copies of these recordings? It, there's, there's, there's a lot of holes there and it, it sort of comes down to the fact that there was the only one record of these he's cracked the case with this one smoke and gun that he's found and then a visitors came in and, 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 and taken it all but the visitor Very convenient isn't it yeah <laughs> and for me it sounds like i don't know he's either got stuck he hasn't been able to do it and he said oh actually yeah of course i've cracked it but it's been so big aliens or the men in black have come in and, and taken the evidence and made a coin disappear <laughs> yeah and, then, and, and lost the so, in the process it's, it's just like it, what? it's too much what I what I would say is that I like a lot of people use this case in two ways. That there's a lot of people that use this to say that well, this is exact evidence that the Men in Black do exist, and that maybe the Men in Black are sort of extraterrestrial in nature. Um, I I spoke about it a little bit last week. I personally don't believe that the UAP phenomena can just be explained away by aliens. So I don't think that there are aliens that are hiding in plain sight as humans, dressing in dark suits. However, going into this subject with a bit of scepticism behind me, ironically what it's done is it's made me much more open to the fact that the men in black probably do exist because there's lots of other cases that I was looking at while investigating this. And some of them, even with CCTV footage, that really, really did freak me out a bit. And this story does freak me out a bit. You know, if it's true that... An, uh, an unnamed entity arrived at this person's house instantaneously and made these things happen, then that's terrifying. But it's for me, it's sort of that first instance of the men in black being a thing. And then a lot of other separate incidences of stuff happening around the world sort of happened within a 15-year period where actually I think that the subject needs to be taken seriously, even if I don't personally believe this story. Um I do think there's some credence to the men in black. I know that sounds ridiculous because I've just spoken about this story that both of us are on the same side of, but I do think that the men in black exist. And I do think this person was visited by the men in black, but that could just be the FBI. That's the thing. It it could just be Project Blue Book. It could be ATIP. It, It could be one of many things, but I thought it was a good sort of story to go through because last week's episode was very like fact, figures, radar data, video, here's everything. Yeah. Whereas this one just I always come back to it because it's always a good story. Well And if it's not true, it's a really interesting story. Well, this is it. For me, um I'm probably a bit further down the, the skeptical line than you on this story. I, I do think it's exactly that. Yeah. That being said though, I do fully believe there are agencies, collectively called them men in black or you know, non-binary in black, just to be fully inclusive. <laughs> um, but I th- there's definitely, I mean, there are 100% agencies or parts of the government which do track these sort of things. I mean, if you go down to just experimental aircraft, it doesn't have to be UFOs or anything like that, just literally experimental aircraft. If someone sees yeah, it... Yeah, I mean, if you look at the stealth bomber, that, that thing was being flown around for like 15 years before it was sort of publicly announced. Exactly, and and that was hidden well. And I mean, how many of these agencies potentially visited people and explained away sightings of it as something else, yeah. or even just, or even just um, made it a bit more elaborate? Oh, so yeah, you saw this the shape in the sky. Did you see that the, the, the trails coming off it? Did it sort of suddenly turn directions? Did it, you know, and, and to create those misdirects? Yeah, to, yeah. To, to feed information. So actually, yeah, I think I did see that. And did you see the light that didn't cast any shadows? That sort of has a turn this, you know, to bank that way and done this way. And the and, and the yeah. sheen of the, you know, the, 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 to sort of slightly obscure what you're looking at. Oh, yeah, I, th- I think I did. I think I did. And then suddenly that becomes the story. It, it could be something as simple as that. 
but there is a hundred percent, as you say, um, with all the NDAs and, and things and top secret military technology, there's going to be protection around it. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously going to be, but there has to be. But I think it's just a lot of people when they talk about this story, they talk about the fact that he was an academic and that he was an everyday man. And like you said at the start, like that, you can't take that into account to build a profile of this story um, because there's lots of everyday men that that could have told this story. But the fact that like he had a wife and kids and he had a good job and he was sort of like a normal person, that doesn't mean that it lend, lends credence to what he's told. Um, for me, I I would love to get a visit from an automaton <laughs> with no lips <laughs> and have a coin <laughs> a coin disappear. Um there's there's a lot to this that I absolutely love. Um but it's that it's that side of UFOs and UAPs that it's always going to do one or two things to people. It's going to put them off the subject forever because look at this crap that someone believes or it's going to do what I do and it makes me think I want to google every single men in black case that's ever happened. And I literally spent two weeks just reading up about these insane stories that, if they're true, do paint a very dark picture of what the government has been doing. Um, because it, it's there's even stories of government agencies planting people into UFO groups to give them false information. So I don't know if you're aware of Bob Lazar at all, Sean. Um, I'll be honest, I recognise the name, but I'm not really sure where from. So Bob Lazar in the sort of like 80, early 90s, late 80s, came out and said, I worked at Area 51, the S4 department, and I worked on UFO craft. And here's all the information they told me. These craft are from Zeta Reticuli, and there was I was backwards engineering the propulsion system, and I took my friends out to see where they were. And a lot of people think that he's a government plant to sort of like tear apart the UFO community. But then a lot of people also think that like he's just talking absolute crap. Yeah. Some people also think that he was working on UFO technology, but that they fed him lots of misinformation so that when he came out with it, he was just telling like completely different stuff and they could say like, well, that's not true. So nothing he said is true. And I think there's a really sinister way that you could look at these, these government agencies where they are actively sort of not destroying people's credibility but they could be really like sowing discontent because ufology hasn't been taken seriously really for a long time and so what better way to make the subject look ridiculous than have academic people come out and tell ridiculous stories does that make sense yeah yeah 100 it actually makes a lot of sense as well so could this guy be a government agent like that's something that I've not even thought about before, but he could be a disinformation agent, told, well, destroy all the evidence and then tell this ridiculous story and see if they believe you. Mm. Because there could have been truth to the Stevens case. And then you go down the rabbit hole of, well, what happens in the Stevens case? Did he get abducted? Why were they so intent on destroying that evidence? And it, it, it really can turn into a rabbit hole, but a rabbit hole that I absolutely adore. <laughs> No, you're right, and as I say, just just agencies and the the way they go around through using the subterfusion, it's it's definitely possible. They are definitely out there as to what level they do. What extent? Yeah, it's it's anyone's guess, really. Pretty much, it is pretty much anyone's guess. Um, now, I think that's really a, a good place to leave it. Is it is anyone's guess because it, it just is. Like, we just don't know what's going on with this. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to go with this case as our second episode because for me it's sort of the complete mirror opposite of our first and I don't want th people to think that we're just going to go into every episode and talk about how this is definitely true and I absolutely believe this because I think that we have to be skeptical by nature when we discuss this subject if it's ever going to be taken seriously we need to really look into the real cases as well as the cases that we might not believe in because we might glean some truth from them you know I believe that parts of this story happened but it's a great story and it makes for a good podcast episode hopefully <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah sean I, I wanted to thank you for coming along this week um james has promised he will be back from the government testing facility that he's currently in um he's 
he's our misinformation agent and he's just being updated again. But Sean, no, it's really good to have you on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having us, Harry. If you ever need us again, uh, and my strange northern dulcet tones, uh, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely will. Um, next week's episode, we are going to be covering the 2007 um, Channel Islands UFO story, which... For me, again, is a very it's a very fact heavy one, so I'm looking forward to that one definitely. Um, for everyone who has enjoyed this episode, like I said at the start of the show, feel free to share it with someone else you think might enjoy this as well. And as we always say, open your mind and watch the skies, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>